to begin with, we must make every effort to make contact with them. In 1972, BBC writer Malcolm Hulk created the Sea Devils for John Pertwee's Doctor Who. It was one of the franchise's most memorable of monsters. Indeed, the Sea Devils were so resonant a creation that 50 years on in 2022, writers Ella Rode and Chris Chibnall revived the Sea Devils for Jodie Whittaker's incarnation of the Doctor. Malcolm Hulk's original storyline was intended as a sequel to his previous Doctor Who series, Doctor Who and the Silurians. Both the Sea Devils and the Silurians were described as ancient terrestrial species who had ruled over planet Earth in a period long before humanity. The Silurians had retreated underground and hibernated to escape the cataclysms created by the Earth's gravitational capture of the Moon, while the Sea Devils had secreted themselves beneath the waters of the Earth's oceans. The idea that there was a civilization here on planet Earth before Earth's capture of the Moon is not new. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle wrote about the Arcadian civilization resident here on Earth before the Moon was captured by the Earth's gravity. And he referred to the culture as the Proselenes, the people before the Moon. But where did the reptilian amphibious image of the sea devils come from? This is an ancient Mesopotamian carving of Oannes. Information about who and what Oannes may have been comes from three ancient Mesopotamian texts. Around 300 of the Common Era, the Greek Babylonian priest Barossus was writing about humanity's great leap forward. Now, this is a question that has long fascinated archaeologists and anthropologists. What was it that enabled our ancestors to make this great leap from living as hunter-gatherers and foragers to being farmers able to cultivate crops, do animal husbandry, create surpluses, and thereby a specialized society. Now we can build cities, now we can become a civilization. What was it that enabled Homo sapiens, after being on the planet for nearly 200,000 years, suddenly to make that leap? I would suggest that our great leap forward is best explained by some kind of an intervention from another civilization. The first farm that we've been able to identify at Karakadag in southeast Turkey happened as a result of 11 naturally occurring plants being modified to become cultivatable crops. Now that modification means the alteration of genes. It is a very specific and technical alteration that has to be made. I used to live on the farm that was the home of William Farrer, who grew up on a farm in Great Britain and with all the benefits of 19th century science, still took 20 years to work out how to change cultivatable wheat into a slightly different cultivatable wheat that could grow in the harsh climate of Australia. Well, apparently this family or tribe, according to Manfred Hoyne, who led the team from the University of Az in Norway, and the Max Planck Institute in Cologne, Germany, took the team in 1998. He said the change was so local, it may have been one family that worked out how to do this gene alteration 11 times over, and they must have been geniuses because they learned how to do animal husbandry at the same time. Now, Barossa says the explanation for that leap wasn't the genius of one family, it was help from another civilization. And that story is repeated by cultures all around the world. You can hear it in the narratives of Mbab Wana Warisa from the Zulu people. You can hear it in the narratives of Aboriginal Australian history, Native American history, the narratives of Nigeria, Sumeria, and the Bible, all state that we were helped. But by whom? Was it the survivors of a previous civilization? And I think there's a case for that. There's a case for saying that the culture that built 
Gebekli Tepe in Turkey may have provided survivors to give tuition to the people at Karakadag to make their fresh start in farming. So it's possible. But it's a big question. Were these helpers around the world the human survivors of a previous human civilization or were they somebody else from somewhere else? The Greek Babylonian priest had an explanation. He told the story of ancient visitors who came to our ancestors and gave us the tutelage we needed in order to make that change. He spoke about a being called Oannes and others that followed him called the Apkalu. Researchers in the vein of Graham Hancock suggest this ancient tuition was given by other human beings, the survivors of previous cultures, the remnant of an earlier civilization. But were the Apkalu human? Well, not by the description that Oannes gave. He described Oannes as an extraordinary monster first witnessed on the shores of the Red Sea. And this is what he wrote. Its entire body appeared like that of a fish, and underneath the head was a second one, like that of a man. His appearance is still remembered and depicted to this day. This being taught people writing, geometry, science and technology of all kinds, the civil engineering for city building, legal systems. He taught how to cultivate grains and harvest fruits. In short, he provided everything that constitutes the marks of a civilization. Every sunset, the monster would return into the sea where it lived under the waves, being amphibious. Later, seven similar beings appeared. Their role was to manage the affairs of Earth according to plans made in the sky. Now that's a very curious note, linking Oannes and the Apkalu with authorities in the sky, there to manage Project Earth. I would suggest that a monster is not the natural language to reach for when describing another human being, associated with advancement, with authorities in the sky, I think there are some dots we can join here. And that physical appearance, he said, was so striking, it is remembered and depicted to this day. And so when we look at the ancient carvings of Awanas and the Apkalu, we are told that these are carvings made to show us what the monsters look like. Now, Barossus isn't the only source of that information from the ancient Sumerian-based cultures. We have another text, Adapa, the purification priest of Eridu, the one who was taken up into the sky. And so we've got an explanation of these strange non-human entities, I would suggest from that description, from an abductee. And so the plot thickens. Why is the management of Project Earth related to plans made in the sky? And where exactly in the sky? A clue to this question is offered by a culture resident in Mali, West Africa. The Dogon people of Mali, West Africa have roots in ancient Egypt, but for centuries their home has been Mali, from 1931 to 1956, French anthropologist Marcel Griol interviewed their elders, the guardians of their traditional knowledge. The elders spoke in detail about ancient tutors called the Nomos, strangely similar to the reptilian amphibious Apkalu remembered by the Babylonians. Curiously, the Dogon elders had advanced astronomical information to share. They spoke of the rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter. They also had information about a triple star system, Sirius A, B and C. They had language which described Sirius B as an incredibly dense object, what today we would call a white dwarf. Western astronomy didn't even know there was a Sirius C 
until 1995. When Griol asked how the Nomos, the ancient tutors, had known about Sirius C, they replied, the Nomos lived on a planet that orbits Sirius C. The Apkalu don't sound human. That's the Babylonian story. If we go to the story of the Yongu people in the Northern Territory of Australia, we have the Mimi spirits or the Mimi beings credited with that tuition. They don't sound human. And in fact, it was their very different physicality that first attracted the attention of the Yongu people. So just as we have this sense of fascination at the amphibious beings, the Apkalu, and what are these clothes they're wearing? What's this textile they've used? It's so thin and shiny and strong. It's like the skin of a fish. And are they amphibious or do they have technology that takes them under the sea? There's that fascination that they are something different. Other Aboriginal Australian stories suggest that our ancient helpers came from the Pleiades, a story that's repeated by Native American traditions. In my book, The Eden Conspiracy, I argue that the Bible's version of this story of tutors helping us with the Great Leap Forward can be found in the stories of Asherah. And the find of a naus at Tel El Farah in that archaeological site curated by Roland de Vaux suggests to me that the Pleiades is identified once again as the source of our ancient helpers. So we're not talking about other humans, we're talking about beings who were similar but different, and they came from another region of space. They came from authorities in the sky, to use the phrase of Barossus. The ancient Hebrew scriptures speak of powerful beings who interacted with our ancestors in the deep past. They were called Elohim. The names included El Elyon, El Shaddai, Yahweh, El of Ekron, El of Egypt, El of the Philistines, Dagon, Baal, and Asherah. Before the 8th century BCE, the Bible was curating a fascinating library of stories about paleocontact and the story of beings who came and taught our ancestors how to make that great leap forward into agriculture and city building, that that story filled its pages. We have beings such as Asherah, and we also have the Philistine recollection of those tutors in the figure of Dagon. Dagon was a reptilian, amphibious, semi-aquatic creature who sounds rather similar once you've read the stories about Oannes and the Apkalu. I think we've got a few pieces of information there. The Apkalu were not human. They didn't dress like the locals. They didn't look like the locals. They were semi-aquatic amphibious beings whom Barossus described as monsters, so not human. And they were part of a force from the sky that was there to govern over Project Earth. So I would suggest it is fair to say these are non-human tutors, these are extraterrestrials. For me, the Hebrew scriptures are a sacred text and surviving all the edits and redactions and translations, the ancient narratives shine through. They are the record of the historic conflict between narratives of ancient ET contact and a religious worldview. I would suggest that Asherah and Dagon are the Bible's language for what the Dogon people called the Nomos and what Barossus called the Apkalu and what colloquially we might call the Sea Devils as they did look rather similar. But whereas the Sea Devils were monsters in the sense of being adversaries of humanity, the Apkalu were monsters, well, they were friendly monsters, here to help us and tutor us and help humanity become a civilization on planet Earth. The Bible shows that prior to the reforms of the 8th century BCE, the Hebrew tradition had used megalithic sites and sacred texts to tell us that in this universe, we are not alone.
But how was the memory of these advanced beings lost? In the Eden Conspiracy, I show that in the Bible, we have a record of an ancient cultural practice of erecting standing stones at places of first contact, the places where our ancestors met advanced beings who arrived from the stars. And we're told in the books of Jeremiah and 2 Kings about certain kings who came along, Hezekiah and Josiah, who wanted to demolish all those megalithic installations in order to obliterate the memory of paleocontact. And yet the Bible records that whole process so that we're forced to remember that before the 8th century BCE, the Bible spoke about these interventions to progress humanity on its path towards civilization. And there was a positive agenda in those changes because what was contributed was the idea of monotheism, that there's only one ultimate God and source of everything. But the change robbed us of a knowledge that we are in a populated cosmos, that we had helpers in the past who gave us very significant help as a species, and that those helpers may very well be around us today to enable us to have a better experience on planet Earth. When I tell people my work is in Bible translation, some people say, well, that's a bit of a rarefied topic, isn't it? But the implications of getting the translation wrong are so huge. And once you start reading the text through the lens of paleocontact, a whole education emerges, an education to do with who we are, where we came from, what is going on on planet Earth, because our ancestors believed we cannot have a full understanding of what happens on this planet until we understand that there is a non-human layer to our story and a non-human layer to human governance. And I find it interesting that ideas like the Apkalu, like the Nomos, like Dagon, like Asherah are so resonant that we can't forget them. The ideas keep coming back and being repeated, whether it's Barossus in 300 of the Common Era or Malcolm Hulk writing in the 1970s, a memory that we're in a populated universe and that some of the company we keep may be menacing, but other company that we keep is here for our benefit to enable us to have a better human experience.